Welcome to this Jungian life. Three good friends and Jungian analysts, Lisa Marciano, Deborah Stewart, and Joseph Lee, invite you to join them for an intimate and honest conversation that brings a psychological perspective to important issues of the day. I'm Lisa Marciano, and I'm a Jungian analyst in Philadelphia. I'm Joseph Lee, and I'm a Jungian analyst in Virginia Beach, Virginia. I'm Deborah Stewart, a Jungian analyst on Cape Cod. Today, Lisa and I are going to be here with you, virtually speaking. Joseph is on vacation. And Lisa and I, long ago, when we were training and we were studying fairy tales, discovered that our favorite fairy tale was Beauty and the Beast. And uh, we both sort of held on to that as a core story in a way. And as you know, fairy tales are our psychic bones. Uh, So they are core stories for all of us. And today we are going to take a good close look at a tale that has been as popular almost as Cinderella for hundreds and thousands of years. So we'll start with Lisa reading a version of the tale, and we'll take it from there. Thanks, Deb. I'm going to share the tale. We're going to read a shorter (laughs) summary of it. I think most people know the tale because, as you pointed out, it has been so very popular. Beauty and the Beast. A wealthy merchant has three daughters, the youngest of which is admired widely for her beauty and comes to be known simply as beauty. Her older sisters are far prouder than she is and let it be known that they will only marry an earl or duke. When their father loses his fortune, the two older sisters find it difficult to adjust to a life of penury. But the loyal and modest beauty sets about finding ways to help out her father around the house. After a year of this, their merchant father receives a letter telling him that a ship containing some of his property has arrived in port, so he sets off to meet it. He asks his daughters what gifts they would like him to bring back for them. The two eldest daughters ask for expensive gowns and jewels, but Beauty requests a simple rose. Their father sets off, but after the legal hearing concerning the ship's property, He leaves with nothing and begins the despondent journey home. On his way, he gets lost in the woods and comes upon a house where he takes refuge. This great house appears to be empty and the merchant falls asleep in it and wakes to find that breakfast has been prepared for him. Going out into the garden, he remembers his promise to beauty and so plucks a single rose from the bush at which point a fearsome beast appears, declaring that he is the owner of the house and that the merchant has insulted his hospitality by stealing a rose. The beast says he will kill the merchant, but the merchant begs for his life, and the beast says he will allow the merchant to live as long as he returns home and brings back one of his daughters to be killed in his stead. Failing that in three months' time, the merchant must return and face his fate. The merchant, seizing the opportunity to see his daughters again, agrees, and the beast gives him a bag full of coins to be on his way home. When he arrives home, the merchant keeps the money a secret, but tells his children about his promise to the beast. When Beauty hears about it, she says she will follow her father back to the beast's palace since she won't allow him to be killed for her. And it was because he plucked a rose for her that the beast sentenced him to death. At the palace, the beast sees that both Beauty and her father have arrived, and so he dismisses the father, who reluctantly and despondently returns home, convinced that the beast will eat up his daughter at the palace. But the beast treats Beauty well, who in turn is kind to the beast. She admits that she finds him physically ugly, but she sees that he has a good heart underneath. He asks her to marry him, and she says no. Not content with this, the beast continues to ask Beauty every night if she will marry him, but each night she says no. 
Beauty, learning that her older sisters have married and her father is all alone at home, asks the beast if she might go and visit him. The beast agrees, since he cannot bear to see Beauty unhappy, but as long as she agrees to return after a week. Beauty agrees to this, but when she is at home with her father, her sisters become jealous of her because she has been given the finest clothes by the beast, while they have married horrible husbands. Her sisters conspire to convince Beauty to stay away from the beast for longer than a week. They hope that by doing so, the beast will be enraged and will come and devour Beauty. But after she has been home for ten nights, Beauty grows ill at ease. Why did she refuse to marry the beast just because he is ugly? He is kind and caring and worships her and wants to make her happy. She would be happier with him than her sisters are with their selfish and cruel husbands. So she resolves to return to the palace. But when she gets there, she find the, finds the beast on the floor unconscious. Bringing him around, he reveals that when she didn't return as promised, he resolved to starve himself. Now she has returned, he can die happy. But Beauty says she will marry him and longs for him to live. No sooner has Beauty said this than the beast disappears and is replaced by a handsome young prince who tells her that an evil fairy cast a spell over him, transforming him into a hideous creature. He would only be freed from the spell when a young woman agreed to marry him. Beauty has freed him from the wicked spell. A beautiful fairy appears and uses magic to transport Beauty's father and her sisters to the palace. The fairy turns Beauty's two older sisters into statues so that they must forever look on their younger sister's happiness. This is the punishment for their malice. Beauty and the prince, formerly known as the Beast, get married and live happily ever after. <laughs> so that was based on the French fairy tale, which is the one that most of us know the best. But there are many, many other versions of this tale from all around the world. There's a, the Grimm's tale is known as the singing springing lark. There's an ancient Greek story, Psyche and Eros, which is a familiar version of this tale. And there are, are literally hundreds of others. I remember as a child uh, reading all kinds of fairy tales. I also was taken to see a little repertory country theater play of Beauty and the Beast. In a small theater, and I, I was fairly far toward the front, which um, when we had any kind of family theater event, the seats were always in the back. So this was really thrilling. And I remember the transformation of the beast where somebody sprang out uh, from, from behind the stage and unzipped something in the back and pulled the beast suit off and ta-da, there was the prince. <laughs> uh, uh, and, and I, but I was a total believer. There was something about the transformation uh, that beauty had, of course, outer beauty and all these other lovely personal characteristics that you read about, like loyalty and modesty, that I don't think would have characterized me as a child. But uh, the be but the beast had this inner beauty that simply needed to be revealed. And that there was something about uh, love and generosity and patience and the willingness to see beneath the surface that absolutely captivated me uh, much more than other ways that other heroines um, had succeeded. You know, that, that sometimes there could be a gutsy heroine like the story of um, the frog prince where she just throws the frog against the wall. And I, I could kind of get that. Or Jack and the Beanstalk, you know, being hidden and stealing and tricking his way to success. There are all kinds of, of flights and hiding stories. Uh, and of course, uh, usually it was a the male hero that got to do battle with dragons and, and other villainous creatures. But the idea of befriending and loving and seeing below the surface to inner beauty totally got me mm -hmm. as 
the mode of transformation. <laughs> I loved this story when I was a kid, but I, I think for me, that moment of transformation was always a little bit of a letdown because there was something so wonderful about imagining her being with the beast. You know, I didn't really want him to become a prince. I just, I wanted her to, you know, to sort of have this, it was somehow more satisfying to to think about him as as the beast and the, the, the final transformation always uh, was a little unsatisfying for me. I'm thinking about all the iterations of this fairy tale in popular culture. And one of the more interesting ones, I think, which relates to my issue about the beast becoming this sort of mamby pamby handsome prince was um, this 90s TV show called Beauty and the Beast. Oh, yes. Which I think starred Linda Hamilton, if I'm not mistaken. It was kind of a, a little bit of a cult hit. Mm -hmm. And it involved, <laughs> it's sort of a strange plot, but it involved this kind of band of outlaws living in the New York City subway tunnels. And among them is a beast who who is kind of like a lion man sort of thing. And, and I'm not sure if we ever find out why he is this way. But in any case, he, you know, the, the, the damsel, uh, the, the, the heroine is, uh, I think she's a lawyer, if I recall. And uh, she's, you know, this very kind of competent, capable woman. But the beast... I think rescues her early on from some bad scrape that she gets in. Hmm. And subsequently they have this, this relationship. She lives most of her life in the above ground world, but mm -hmm. visits him periodically or, or something like that. Anyway. So she does have this kind of, it's not really clear if it's a consummated relationship with the beast, but he does not transform. And I remember someone pointing out that many women who had abuse histories loved that show. Oh, my gosh. I thought gosh. that was kind of a fascinating mm. connection to make. I, I remember that show, and I, I loved it. And I loved uh, Beauty's empowerment in that series because she could traverse the realms. She had access to both worlds, it's an, a metaphor for, you know, the unconscious, those darker realms in uh, the sewer system or the subway tunnels, you know, below ground, what looks ugly on the outside, but has uh, gifts, fruitfulness, goodnesses, you know, the treasure. I remember her going down to consult the beast, mm. th that he was her mentor, basically. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Yeah, well, it, it is an image of a sort of rich inner world, isn't it? A rich mm -hmm. inner fantasy life, if you if you will. By the way, I'm I'm thinking that the creators of that show must have been had a connection with Jung because one of the characters I'm recalling now was Paracelsus. Oh, <laughs> I didn't remember yeah, that. Yeah, but I I hear you too about liking the story of the relationship between beauty and the beast as beast. Mm -hmm. uh, I liked the happily ever after part of it, like the the sort of redemption piece of like, see, if you do the hard work and you really love this uh, creature for who he is and his inner goodness, that then it will get manifested in the outer world with in the form of the handsome prince. But what I'm also thinking about is, isn't it lovely to have a story about a woman being loved for herself, loved freely, and no obligation on her part? That she's in the beast's palace, and every night he says, will you marry me? And every night she says no. But every day she has the run of the place, lovely things to eat, all her wishes are granted. He doesn't demand anything back mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. well and of course this this question that we're sort of circling around here in all of these stories that we've mentioned this period of time in which she's with the beast and there is no demand made on her like you're saying deb 
and he hasn't transformed. This is a kind of particular psychological state. And it's interesting that it's the one that as a kid, I was like, no, no, stay there, stay there. <laughs> because it's kind of a provisional happy ending, right? I mean, it's not the, it's not the happy ending, but there's a provisional uh, uh, stasis where, mm -hmm. you know, in Psyche and Eros, for example, you know, she is sacrificed to a beast, apparently, but instead she's actually wafted down to this beautiful palace that she has the run of every day. And at night, uh, this her lover comes and, and makes love to her, but it's dark and she can't see him. And it, it turns out that it's none other than the god Eros. But it's this period of being in the dark. Something is unconscious. You know, Psyche doesn't know who this guy is. Beauty can kind of traipse around the palace all day and have fun. But there's no, like you said, there's no demand made on her in other stories of the same kind. It's a, it's a period of seeming happiness, but it's an unstable thing because it is predicated on a lack of consciousness. Hmm. It's like uh, there's not been a full integration or, or recognition or, or a confrontation with what's actually going on. Yeah, it reminds me of, um, a, well, it is sort of a mirroring of the adult-child relationship uh, in its ideal form, that the child is loved, cl clothed, fed, adored, delighted in, and, uh, you know, no demands are made on a, on a two-year-old or really even a four- or five-year-old in any significant way. That the child is free to to roam and play and develop himself or herself secure in unconditional love, you know, at, at least ideally. Yeah, that's that's a great that's a really interesting point. You're you're right about that. That that it's a it's a wonderful place to be, but you can't stay there if you're going mm -hmm. to be a kind of psychologically mature person. You know, I want to maybe take it back for a second and just kind of hit this thing that's always right there for me whenever this tale comes up, because a lot of people who aren't looking at this tale psychologically feel that it's, uh, a, for example, teaches girls a terrible thing that you should stay with an abusive partner, that this is a fairy tale about Stockholm syndrome. And I just want to put it immediately in a psychological and symbolic frame in which we understand the beast to be an aspect of her psyche. So uh, just like a dream, we assume that every person or element in a fairy tale is an aspect of a single psyche. So it's not the case that this is about uh, a woman who is robbed of her agency and devotes herself to a monstrous partner and what we're teaching girls is just uh, stay with the jerk and eventually he'll transform into a handsome prince. This is about a psyche that's been wounded. And I, I have a particular hypothesis about the nature of the wounding that's depicted in the story. I happen to think it's a father wound. And then this fairy tale depicts the transformation of that wounded part of the psyche, we could call it the negative father complex. So that the beast then is an image of a kind of uh, negative animus that is related to having had a wound by the father. And if I can just spool this out a bit more, my hypothesis that it's about a father wound comes from the fact that in most versions of the story, I'm thinking of the Grimm's version, I'm thinking of this French version that we just that we just read, I'm thinking of uh, Eros and Psyche, I'm even thinking of the Persian version of this story. It is the father who sacrifices her. So mm -hmm. in the French version, of course, you know, he he lets her go to the beast. He's, you know, he's okay, 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 you 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 can go in my stead. You know, she insists, but he he doesn't say, no beast, go ahead and kill me. I want to protect my daughters. He's actually happy to let her go in his stead. 
And there are versions of that in all of these stories. In Psyche and Eros, the the parents have visited the Oracle of Delphi, if I'm not mistaken, and been to- been told that you know that this terrible fate awaits their daughter, and that she has to be sacrificed to this monster. And the parents do it, believing that they are leaving her for dead. And in the Persian version, the father kicks the daughter out of the house, and and on and on like that. So this is a daughter who's been deeply, deeply wounded. And the experience that she has at the beast's castle is about how she transforms this negative complex. Also, I think um, it is very much a theme uh, in, in fairy tales and in mythology around the father. Um, I'm thinking about the uh, whole Greek play series of Agamemnon, who is a uh, king and is about to sail to Troy to go to war. Now all the ships are loaded with men and supplies and everything, and there is no wind, so they cannot sail. And he is told that he has to sacrifice his daughter, and he does. Yeah, and it sets in motion all of these tragedies. Exactly. And the marriage customs in... Uh, the Levant, the ancient world of Mediterranean countries, was that uh, the young, uh, a marriage would be made for mutual advantageous family alliances and prosperity. And that very often the woman did not know the person she was going to marry. It was something that the men did in various families, and it was pretty transactional. And off went uh, the young woman to be married to an advantageous partner, advantageous for her father, and advantageous for the groom's family and father. So it was pretty business-like, and the qualities of the man the woman was going to marry, I, I think, were not you know much considered at all. Mm. Mm-hmm. But I was thinking that, in a way, the beast represents a kind of positive animus. I mean, the father looks good but behaves badly. The beast looks bad, but he behaves kindly, Mm -hmm. generously, even indulgently, Mm -hmm. and gives her a chance to experience uh, the undemanding, uh, truly giving Mm -hmm. uh, side of, of, as you say, of her own inner masculine. You know, to see this tale as a tale of sticking with an abusive person, no, the beast is not abusive. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, unlike some other stories where the beast is awful and irredeemable, such as the Minotaur or the Phantom of the Opera, Mm -hmm. where, where he seduces this young woman, Christine. He teaches her to sing, and then he maneuvers so that she becomes the star of the show. And she's also in love with a young man. And this phantom is a deformed man who lives underground. Eventually, I think he accedes to her bonding with a young man who is her appropriate mate. But it's a story of unrequited love. And as the phantom, he is irredeemable. Mm. You raise such a good point, Deb, that in all of these stories, the beast, whatever that is, whether it's Eros or the lion in the singing springing lark or the beast in the French tale, uh, in a lot of stories, it's a snake. But in, in most of these stories, the beast is fundamentally good from the beginning, even when he's, mm-hmm. you know, sort of frightening in his form. It brings up that there's something transpersonal in this content. It's something not quite human. And that is the way it is, right? The 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 animus connects us with the deep inner world, with the the realm of the archetypes and the collective unconscious. And so through her wounding, through the father wound, The woman in this tale has access to that level of the psyche. 
And that, again, takes me back to the 90s TV show. Because I think that when we've been wounded, particularly if we've been traumatized, actually, there is a way that trauma puts us in immediate contact with the transpersonal level of the psyche in a dark way, often. Mm. But we have an intimation of something beyond the merely human. Mm -hmm. Beauty gets that in this story. She has this contact with this thing that is not quite human. And can we learn to love that part of ourselves, our instinctual, unattractive, bestial side, when uh, so many of us were raised to be nice girls? And I'm remembering uh, James Hollis, a Jungian analyst and author who came to teach us, uh, who said that Jungians are recovering nice people. <laughs> And that she does have to get in touch with her bestial, instinctual uh, qualities. Yeah, yeah, because she's she's very self-sacrificing, and oh, she's with the beast. There's this encouragement actually for her to be a little bit selfish. Exactly. Every night when she says no, sorry, can't marry you, uh, she is learning to just be self-determined. And to be, you know, she's not seeing what a wonderful person he is, and that's okay. Um, I, I don't mind that you look like an animal. I love you anyway. No, she's learning to say, uh, those things really, really matter to me. Whereas where she starts out, it's like, oh, don't worry about me. You know, I'm happy to die and be devoured by a beast for your sake, Dad. Uh, she's a wuss. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Well, and, and all she wants is a rose, right? Yeah. You know, her sisters want gowns and jewels and all that stuff. And and part of me always felt like, you know, what are you kidding me? I could think of some stuff you could bring home for me, Dad. Um, <laughs> what am I? What am I going to do with a rose? Oh, please give me a break. <laughs> you know, it's it's interesting because um, so th this this is a this is an interesting part of the story. So in the the Persian version, it's called the Pink Pearl Prince, and it's a very similar setup. The, oh, it's the father's going, uh, he's, he's going to make the pilgrimage, he's going to uh, uh, participate in the Hajj. So he says, you know, he asks his daughters what they, what they want, and the first two daughters want a diamond-encrusted pen and a <laughs> diamond-encrusted this or something, and, and all um, the youngest daughter wants is um, a pink pearl. And and so we have a rose and a and a pearl and and so what about that and you know I think the thing about both a pearl and a and a rose is that they are often symbols for the divine. So a rose in Christian iconography is incredibly important and is associated uh, with the Virgin Mary. It maps onto the significance of the lotus. In uh, Eastern religions, both the rose and the lotus, if you look at them as they unfold, they're really like mandalas. So there's this sense of something in the center that then is unfolded. And a pearl, you know, is, is again, a sort of a single pearl. There's that beautiful passage from Matthew about the man who finds a pearl of great price mm. and sells everything to buy it. So both the rose and the pearl are something of transpersonal value. It's not something that's just materially luxurious. It is something of uh, abiding value beyond the material realm. I want to talk about the sisters. Let's talk about the sisters. Oh, sisters in fairy tales are, are often depicted as uh, pretty awful people. In the tale of Psyche and Eros, Psyche is so beautiful, and she winds up living in the Crystal Palace with her lover who only comes at night. And the sisters visit, and they, they undermine her. They're so envious. They say, you know, what do you mean? You've never even seen him. You don't know what he looks like. What if he's, what if he's a giant snake? What if he's, he's, you got to take a look. And from there, of course, the tale unfolds 
uh, Psyche dares to look at him at night and is holding either a lamp or a candle and a drop of hot candle wax or hot oil falls on him and then she's off to her. He leaves and she has to go through all kinds of trials to win him back. The same thing happens in uh, the Grimm's version of the singing Springing Lark, where she has to go through all kinds of adventures and trials to win him back. Uh, Cinderella's sisters were notoriously awful and envious. And so there's this element of the feminine uh, that is depicted in a particularly negative way because the, the gifts of Psyche or Cinderella or beauty uh, spark envy. And I think a lot of young women learn to, um, therefore, be modest, don't stretch your stuff, don't be too big, don't, you know, don't think too highly of yourself. I mean, envy is really powerful, actually. And I, I have noticed in my practice that a lot of women have trouble protecting themselves from envy because they can't imagine that anyone could be envious of them. You know, and, and I'll sort of, oh, do you, could it be this? You know, they're, mm. they're sort of, they're being maybe attacked by someone and I'm, you know, kind of trying to help them think through what might be going on. And I can see pretty clearly to me that it looks like envy and that uh, the, the woman in front of me ought to be trying to protect herself a little better. But she's like, well, what? I don't, I don't, how could that be? So we can have a kind of naivete about envy and it's a, yeah. it can be a very powerful force. I mean, one of the things about fairy tales that feature these, these negative sisters in particular, it's I'm always a little, it's always a little tricky to kind of, get that symbolic lens around it and see how is this an image of a part of the psyche that's relating to the ego. But I think that it can picture a kind of psychological state in which we have trouble being sort of appropriately selfish. And the sisters are kind of the voices that tell us that we need to, uh, you know, who do we think we are and, and that kind of thing. In these stories in particular, the Beauty and the Beast stories, you know, the sisters are so ambivalent, actually, because while they definitely are going after their sister out of envy, and they initially, their behavior winds up uh, making the situation much, much worse, they also are always in the interest of greater consciousness, and is their intervention that brings mm -hmm. about the fuller integration and the awareness of you know what what's what's happening so the ultimate transformation mm -hmm. wouldn't exist without the sisters and that's always the case in fairy tales that there's there's always that element of paradox which is one of the reasons i love them yeah one of the lessons symbolically whether it's the proverbial step, wicked stepmother or the weak father who either doesn't intervene or in this tale is willing to sacrifice his daughter, uh, the envious sisters, that those uh, wounds, injustices, all kinds of unfairness in these stories time and time and again allow the hero or heroine to develop the hero, heroine, uses it to become more whole, to become victorious. And without some of this opposition, wouldn't be motivated, wouldn't have the spur to develop, especially, I think, to overcome an innocence complex. Yes, yes, that's a great point. And uh, female protagonists, I think, are particularly prone to innocence. That's a great point. It just didn't see that my sisters were really envious and were setting me up. They were gaslighting me. Doesn't get it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The qualities that were admired in our heroine were loyalty and modesty. You know, how many of us would really aspire uh, to living a life 
based on on those values that can easily just get turned into subjugation and not becoming whole, not becoming real. Yeah. Uh, so, so the innocence has to be tempered, and um, these fairy tales use other characters as the psychic to represent psychic forces that do that. Yeah, it's kind of like the sisters are the ones who are saying, come on, <laughs> get over yourself, get out yeah. there, what are you doing? You know, let's let's get over get over your innocence. Yeah. Open your eyes, put the light on. <laughs> look and see what there is to see, Cookie. And let's get the show on the road here in terms of you growing up a little bit. Yes. So that the sisters, you know, ultimately do her a great favor in all of these cases. Mm-hmm. But it doesn't it looks like she's getting, you know, kicked in the tail a little bit and she is. Wake up. You know, I, th- I think uh, another interesting element of most of these tales is the enchantment. Absolutely. You know, what, what has happened that the man has been turned into a beast or a lion or a snake or... Or a or, fish. Uh-huh. And we never know, do we? Well, in, in the Grimm's version, there is uh, an evil sorcerer. And we find out a little bit more about that at the end of the tale. Yeah. But it, it's it's often we don't know much about it. It's kind of his yeah. origin story. We don't we don't find out much about right. it. But th- that's what I think I'm pointing to is it may be, you know, some sort of uh, evil spirit, a fairy, a sorcerer doesn't matter. But that you know, like in the Frog Prince, the, he's an enchanted prince. Fisherman and his wife, he's an enchanted fish. In this story, he's been enchanted into uh, being a beast. Mm -hmm. But by some power, quote, out there somewhere, but for no cause that is ever mentioned. Mm -hmm. Right. That because you did this, um, here's your punishment. It's simply what is. It's just a just so story. Mm -hmm. Something happened. And how does that happen in the psyche? That some part of us has simply been enchanted. Mm -hmm. And again, I mean, I would link back to this kind of psychic wounding that the, the animus, as you pointed out so well, it's, you know, this kind of positive aspect of the animus is transformed into something that at least looks very different or unknowable or frightening or, uh, you know, sometimes has real destructive capacity, maybe. You know, we have to learn to relate to it, and uh, we have to kind of humanize it in a way. Mm-hmm. And, and, and that's part of the psychological development. So one of the, I guess, sort of like clinical examples I could give, or I, I guess I've really sort of made this up, but I'll share it anyway, is a few years ago I wrote a paper about Beauty and the Beast, I, I actually use uh, the singing springing lark and compare it with the novel Jane Eyre by Charlotte Bronte. And I'm not the first to point out the significant overlaps in these stories. And I don't know that anyone knows whether or not Charlotte Bronte knew she was doing that, but many people have noted it before me. Um, But what I will say is that uh, we have some evidence to assert that uh, Charlotte had a negative father complex. Biographers differ, but in general, Patrick Bronte doesn't get a very, uh, he gets a little bit of a bad rap, maybe somewhat unfairly, but there are certainly reports that we have of him, uh, you know, treating particularly his daughters very cruelly. He really preferred his son, who was a 'er ne'er-do-well and an alcoholic, and I think also a heroin addict or an opiate addict, and never really did anything of note. While, meanwhile, his daughters were off, like, writing some of the greatest literature in the English language. I don't think he knew that Emily had published poetry by the time she died maybe he learned later but they kept it a secret from him 
Charlotte brought him Jane Eyre and said, Father, you know, I've written a book. I want you to read it. And he said, I can't be bothered to read manuscript. She said, no, no, it's been published. And uh, he, he was like, well, you know, why'd you waste your time doing that for? But he took it and he read it. And then he was like, children, Charlotte's written a book and it's not half bad. <laughs> you know, but by this point, she's like famous. Wow. This book is famous, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, it's just such an incredible story. And then when she wanted to get um, married, he was just awful. He didn't go to the wedding. He didn't go to her wedding. He was, and she was older. She was like in her late 30s at that point, you know. Anyway, I could go on, but I'll stop yeah. here and just say that, you know, I imagine that Charlotte Bronte had this significant father wound. And then she creates this masterpiece of, you know, kind of an extended active imagination of this this young penniless girl who winds up in this beautiful but kind of foreboding castle with this dark beastly man who is gruff but but at his core he's incredibly intelligent and sophisticated and worldly just like the beast but he he seems very beastly and uh on the one hand he treats her abominably but on the other hand she knows happiness the likes of which she's never experienced before. And then there is the same knot in the plot where there's a kind of unconscious happiness, right? Char um, Jane and Rochester become engaged and Jane is thrilled about that. It's not to be because he's actually married. And then we go into your question, Deb, which is, how did he get enchanted? Well, he got enchanted because he wound up marrying this this woman who's insane. And then there is the 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 part of the book where she is cast into the wilderness, uh, which also happens in in Beauty and the Beast in a very short way. It happens in the other stories in a much longer way, like with Psyche and Eros or the Singing Springing Lark, where the heroine has to go out and go through many trials and ordeals on her own before she can return to her lover and transform him, which is what happens at the end of Jane Eyre. So I was struck by this when I reread Jane Eyre as I love, I love that book. So I reread it just for fun. And I was thinking about, about it and read somewhere that someone said it was the perfect female fantasy. And I was like, wait a minute wait a minute, what? And then I was like, oh yeah, Rochester's not like a really fully drawn character. You know, he is a female fantasy, just like in the 90s TV show, right? You know, I want to be rescued by this kind of dark brooding man who's going to take care of me, but ultimately is, um, you know, a kind of image of an inner potential. And I recognized uh, that it is, not really a story about these two people. It's really a story about this single psyche, Jane, and how she transforms this negative father complex, which my hypothesis is that Charlotte was able to do that through the use of her creative imagination, which she left mm. for us in the form of this novel. So it's interesting uh, and very much a psychic and literary trope that a part of ourselves, our female inner other known as the animus, is depicted as, you know, a, a beast or uh, in Jane Eyre as Rochester. And we see our inner other first in some outer person. Mm, mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Right? That, um, oh my God, you know, poor Psyche's been relegated to be devoured by the monster who becomes her lover, who, etc. Jane uh, falls in love with Rochester, and uh, Beauty falls in love over time with the beast. Mm, mm. And yet really the task is the task of inner development. Yeah. And it's as, you correct me if I'm wrong, because I haven't read Jane Eyre for <laughs> a, a couple of hundred years. Um, <laughs> but it is in 
coming into their own wholeness and Jane coming into her wholeness and basically saying to Rochester, you know, that's it, uh, you know, kind of get with the program, grow up uh, and, you know, s- stop acting like this, that when he sees her whole, that is when he is redeemed. That's when the transformation happens. I think I, think I wound up uh, where I landed with it was that the transformation really happens when she's able to stop being so self-sacrificing. Mm-hmm. You know, it kind of it, there, yeah. we don't have that moment of the transformation, but she she re, uh, refuses the marriage proposal from her cousin, and it's right around that time that she hears Rochester's voice calling her name, and it's this kind of supernatural phenomenon. And then she goes back and finds out that, in fact, his um, crazy wife is is now deceased. So uh, anyway, I um, I don't want to recapitulate all of this, but it it is Deb. I, I so appreciate that you you brought up that this is a process. This process of psychological development begins often when our inner animus, our our inner other, the inner partner is projected on someone else. Mm -hmm. But it isn't kind of an inside job, ultimately, to do that work. And so it's very interesting to consider, especially in public uh, people, where we have a story and photographs. I mean, it's we don't know them, but there's a story that's out there of who's attracted to whom. You know, is this person attracted to some older man, and everybody gasps in shock that, you know, here's this guy that's 30 years older. Is this person attracted to a proverbial bad boy? Uh, (laughs) The James Dean revving around on his motorcycle, um, maybe doing drugs. It's, It's such an interesting mode of observation as to Who's attracted to whom? And we never stop to think about, and that is a part of her. Right. Of course, it works the other way, too. Uh, But uh, today's focus at Beauty and the Beast, I'm uh, standing much more from uh, taking the perspective of the woman, Mm -hmm. a feminine Mm -hmm. perspective and relationship to to animus. Mm Mm-hmm. Yeah, there is that experience that I think many women have of being drawn to someone who might fit <laughs> the beast image a little bit, whether it's someone mm-hmm. who's kind of dark and brooding or like you said the bad mm-hmm. boy or something like that, but we we see we project this part of ourselves out on that person and are drawn to that because we sense actually the potential for transformation. Mm -hmm. So one of the advice that, you know, is given to women, well, to men too, it's like, don't fall in love with someone thinking you're going to change them. Mm -hmm. You know, you're, you're never supposed to do that. But our desire to transform the other person, I think has a deep psychological taproot is we know that our own inner transformation is needed. Through the trials and tribulations that are depicted in some of these stories. Yes. And it's through having to stand up to an other from one's own place. I mean, beauty does not transfer her uh, proverbial modesty and loyalty and love for her father and subservience to the beast. She says, no, sorry, not. I can't, I won't marry you. So it's the spur to coming into one's own truer nature, one's own self, and a very different kind of loyalty in this tale to the beast that when she goes home, uh, she overstays her visit. But then she has a pretty ethical sense of, wait a minute, I gave my word. I said I'd be back. I've overstayed. I really do care for him because he earned her love, her loyalty. He earned it Mm -hmm. by not pressuring her, not forcing her, not making demands on her. 
You know, um, you, you raise such a good point, I think, about the person has to kind of find her own stance vis-a-vis her own psyche. Mm-hmm. Like, this might be a development where the woman actually says, no, I'm not just going to continually sacrifice myself for everyone else's needs. But we have to do that on an inner level as well sometimes. And especially as it relates to the negative animus, this is something marie mm-hmm. Louise von Franz talks about. So that if, if you are kind of ridden by negative animus energies, which can manifest as like harsh inner criticism all the time, or these kind of demands that you always sacrifice yourself, kind of standing up and saying, you know what? No, I actually am not going to do that anymore. I don't believe that. That's not me. That's not who I am. That's some other some other voice that I can choose to have a kind of confrontation with. So a lot mm-hmm. of times on the podcast and in Jungian thought in general, we talk about the ego having to be more receptive toward the unconscious. But it is also true that sometimes the ego has to take a stand against something that's coming from the unconscious. You know, it's not exactly the same as rejecting it or repressing it, but it is having a stance. I'm not going to listen to that voice that says that I constantly have to do everything for other people and I'm never allowed to do Mm -hmm. anything for myself. I can actually have a conscious relationship with that inner demand and decide to deal with it differently. Mm -hmm. You know, I think, or I'm wondering aloud here, you know, back when there was the, the women's movement of the, of the seventies, the women's lib movement, there were consciousness raising circles and so on and so forth. And that, that first uh, effort to stand up against and take a stand for oneself, you know, can can often just look like a rejection or a rebellion before we come to a more conscious stance that says what other people want and need matters and what I want and need matters. Now, how am I going to navigate these uh, tricky passages that are, you know, w- without just either acceding or rebelling. Right. And I think that is long, hard work. Yeah. And that's not what this tale of beauty and the beast is about. Mm-hmm. <laughs> but I, you know, the fantasy would be that after he becomes a prince and they get married and they have uh, several children, you know, then what? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Uh, is she expected to be the good mother, good wife, charming partner, beautiful person, 24-7? Is there a role expectation for her? How do they negotiate through that harder passage? Well, the the one thing I would say is that a woman who's gone through the development that's depicted in the fairy tale has access to her beast energy, and she has access to her prince energy. So she can go out into the world, the external world now, with different resources at her disposal. Oh, there is a happy ending. <laughs> <laughs> Ta-da! <laughs> so before we uh, go to this week's Dream and Dreamer, I'm just going to put in a word, uh, as we do every week, for taking a look at our website and taking a look at Dream School. We obviously know, have learned, and believe with all our hearts that getting to know your dream maker enhances waking life in myriad ways. So please take a look at Dream School and see if that might be something you could engage in. This week's dreamer is a man. He's 22 years old, and he just graduated from college and is looking for a job as a technical designer. 
And here's the dream. I'm at a social function in a chic, minimal, modern venue. The attendees include some close friends, notably my mother and one of my best friends. I'll call her Jane. There are chefs at the function making gorgeous food out of flowers and something resembling gelatin. At a certain point, the chefs call me over to give me a special thing. They hand me a translucent green jelly orb with a purple flower resembling a witch alder suspended in the center. It's clear to me that I am meant to pass the orb around to the attendees at the party. As they pass it around, most members only touch it, but once it gets to Jane, she puts the flower in her mouth and pulls it out like a lollipop. For context, the dreamer adds, I'm currently in a limbo stage between school and the real world. I know where I want to go geographically, but I still have to find a job and an apartment. Also, in the evening, before I fell asleep and had this dream, I experienced a grief episode, for lack of a better term, over the man I love. We talk every day and are romantically and intimately involved, but aren't exclusive or official because we have yet to live in the same city but we will once I get my job and apartment. I got scared that he would leave me one day and that I would be incapable of keeping myself happy and afloat without him. I also had another dream this same night in which I was riding piggyback style on his shoulders, and he was running around and moving me up and down. It felt like a roller coaster, and I felt an amazing feeling of pure love and trust. The main feelings in the dream were pleasure, intrigue, and feeling special. And for additional context, he adds, Jane is one of my best friends. She symbolizes trust, comfort, being seen, growth, intelligence, genius, beauty, charisma. The orb with a flower. I saw witch alders the day before I had this dream. I stopped to take a picture because they were so gorgeous. So... Here we have someone who's at a point of major transition in his life. And he has what I suspect is a very positive dream. And uh, I think it's positive because just initially, without having spent much time with it, it uh, it has a lot of seemingly positive imagery but also because the feelings are, are so positive in the dream. So sometimes we have dreams that are highly positive at moments like this, almost as if the psyche is kind of uh, reassuring us or giving us a little shot in the arm as we move forward into something difficult. Uh, So, you know, Jung talked about how dreams are compensatory. Sometimes when we're facing something particularly difficult, we have a dream that uh, presents us with an image of the sort of longed-for happy ending. And dreams like this can also just sort of be like a thumbs up, you know? Yep, like you're, you're moving in the right direction. I think there just is so much uh, in the initial setting because it is a picture or a metaphor for the psychic situation. And I think you're right, Lisa, that this dream is balancing out our dreamer's real-world anxieties about this major life transition. And so the dream maker says, no, everything is okay. There's a social function, and it's in a chic, minimal, modern venue. And then the dream maker goes on to embellish that, um, that they're, they're close friends, and the food is gorgeous. So things just go from good to better and better with this uh, very interesting and symbolic uh, creation of a translucent green jelly orb with a purple flower resembling a witch alder in the center. So it almost looks like a snow globe, doesn't it? Mm -hmm, Right. (laughs) 
<laughs> well, here's a couple of thoughts that I have about it. So I'm I'm struck by the dream the dreamer noting that he's he has some fear that if this relationship doesn't work out, he would be incapable of kind of keeping himself afloat. So there must be a tremendous sense of vulnerability. And I note that they're not exclusive or official. So there's some there's some uh, kind of a tentativeness. Yeah, there's some tentativeness mm-hmm. here. There's something it's it's not he doesn't quite have it, this thing that he really wants that he's moving toward. So then in the dream, you know, the one thing I'll say about a social function is it, it's possible it's a little ambivalent because a social function is often the kind of the realm of the collective. It's maybe uh, how we want people to perceive us. Maybe it's a little bit related to persona. Maybe. I think it's interesting that his mother and Jane are there. Exactly. The feminine is mm-hmm. featured and I, I'm curious about this dreamer's relationship with his mother. If the dreamer were here, that would be one of the first questions I would ask. But I'm going to guess that there is some connection between Jane and the mother psychologically. I don't know if there's any connection in real life, but they're mentioned in the same sentence, and they both sort of show up in the dream at the same time. Obviously, Jane is an incredibly positive image for this dreamer, and I'm I'm guessing without any evidence to the contrary that the the mother may be a positive figure too. So in this time of uncertainty and vulnerability and tentativeness, the dreamer is supported by these very positive female energies, which we could consider to be the anima. And of course, this opens up a whole discussion about whether or not the inner structures in the psyches of, uh, say, gays and lesbians, do they kind of manifest the same way? And we could have that discussion. But uh, for the sake of argument, I will say that many feel that, yes, they do manifest the same way. And so Jane would be an image of of Anima, who is showing up in right. a very supportive role. Right. The, the food is gorgeous, but I want to say that it's made out of flowers and gelatin. So I don't <laughs> know how substantive it is. I, I went uh, to, I think, a very similar place with uh, noticing how positive the feminine is in this dream. And that Jane uh, symbolizes trust, comfort, being seen, growth, intelligence, genius, beauty, charisma. Wow. Right? That, that's, <laughs> that's quite a quite, list. That it sure is. Uh, so the inner other is here in the form of Jane and uh, presumably, I agree with you, Lisa, in, uh, in the form of the mother. The inner other is there. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And we don't need to get so terribly hung up on, you know, all the gender stuff. Um, which Psyche is not at all interested in anyway. And I agree that the food is, this particular food item is a little weird. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. If we were to literalize it, it's a little sort of shaky, a gelatinous thing with a flower in the middle being passed around. The other thing about uh, edible flowers, and you know, I, I mean, who doesn't love an edible flower? But they're they're for garnish. They're for appearance. Mm-hmm. You know, I mean, one can eat flowers. My guess is that they probably have some nutritional content. But you, when you cook with flowers, for the most part, it's not even really about the flavor. It's it's just about the kind of visual appeal. Like if you make a a salad and you put some flower it, yeah. petals in it or something, it's for color. It's for interest. It's for fun. Mm-hmm. It's like oh, and here's a flower that's a garnish. And guess what? You can eat it. Mm-hmm. Um, we don't typically think about eating flowers for and nutritional so, value. Exactly. I had to look up what a witch alder is mm-hmm. because it doesn't have a very pretty name, uh, but it is a gorgeous flower with all kinds of uh, sort of finger like, tiny finger like petals springing out all over. It's very round mm-hmm. and, and very appealing. But what I think of here in this dream uh, play or, or drama is it gets passed around 
Most members only touch it, but Jane puts the flower in her mouth and pulls the flower, puts it in her mouth and pulls the flower out like a lollipop. You know, and I want to say, wow, you know, Jane really goes for it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Jane asserts herself. And that there is uh, that kind of proactive willingness to ingest, to integrate, to incorporate something round, something beautiful, something special, the image of taking it in. You, you know, the, the other thing that strikes me about the plant is that uh, it has witch in the name. And ah. so, so here we are again in the in the realm of the feminine, and it's the transformational feminine, you know, that which you know that aspect of the feminine that has access to something not quite human, you know, some kind of powers of uh, the transpersonal. There's something really being underscored here about about the feminine, and it happens to be a purple flower too, which I think is something interesting that we could talk about more. But you're right that um, Jane seems to be able to access this in a very ready way. And it is so surprising that she does it. You know, it's not sort of what we're expecting will happen. Mm -hmm. And so in that sense, it sort of feels like this is a statement the dream is making. If I were going to hazard a guess about what this dream might be about, it might be encouraging the dreamer to lean into his own inner Jane in the face of this uh, transition that he's going to go through, both in terms of looking for a job and moving into the professional world, but maybe mm -hmm. maybe even in terms of the relationship. That he's he's got this real inner strength that he maybe doesn't even right. fully know yet. Absolutely. And Jung is very clear about all of the characters in the dream, the dream setting, the prompter, the playwright, the director, are all aspects of the dreamer. I think that's right on. Of Our dreamer has an inner Jane. It's a very encouraging dream. This would be something that he could find even in the midst of this uncertainty and even this grief. Yes. You've been listening to This Jungian Life. From our website, thisjungianlife.com, you can follow us on Twitter, like us on Facebook, help us produce future episodes by funding us through Patreon, and submit your dreams for possible interpretation on another episode. We'd like to thank our listener who shared a dream for today's show and hope you'll let us know what topics you'd enjoy hearing more about. Until next time, keep living this Jungian life.